We succeeded in what we set out to do in Afghanistan over a decade ago. Then we stayed for another decade. It was time to end this war. This is a new world. The terror threat has metastasized across the world, well beyond Afghanistan. And here's a critical thing to understand. The world is changing. We're engaged in a serious competition with China. We're dealing with the challenges on multiple fronts with Russia. We're confronted with cyber attacks and nuclear proliferation. We have to shore up America's competitive to meet these new challenges in the competition for the 21st century. When I was running for president, I made a commitment to the American people that I would end this war. Today, I've honored that commitment. All right, that was the U.S. President Biden just a few moments ago, a firm defense of his exit strategy from Afghanistan to discuss this speech and the historic nature of today. I'm joined here at the big table by DW's William Glucroft and in Washington, our bureau chief, Enos Poe. Enos, let me start with you. The president making it clear that as he sees it and as he is being advised, boots on the ground, military presence in foreign countries, that's no longer the way to fight a war against terror. What do you make of that? Right, he said that this is uh, the end of an era that the United States, at least under his watch, won't have boots on the grounds to build nations to bring democracy to the world. He made it crystal clear uh, that it is only about the interests uh, of the American people, that it was never uh, the case that they wanted to help Afghan people in Afghanistan, but only uh, to fight terrorism and uh, uh, prevent another terror attack being conducted or planned in Afghanistan. So uh, that was a very, very strong defense of his uh, decision to, to withdraw all the troops uh, from Afghanistan. And Prend, it was also crystal clear the way he mentioned uh, Donald Trump, that he also uh, wanted to send a message to uh, his Critic, critics here in the United States that it was not only his idea but also the idea of President uh, Donald Trump to end this war and that President Donald Trump negotiated with the Taliban and allowed 5,000 Taliban prisoners uh, to leave prison. So he really draw a little bit of a bigger picture, but again stood crystal clear with his decision to withdraw all American troops from uh, Afghanistan by last night. Yes, I mean, he was trying to re refresh, if you will, the, the memories of Americans, wasn't he, William, that this is not a war he started. This is um, a, a campaign that he inherited, and he was going to keep his promise to end it, and that he has done. Correct. I mean, if we go with President Biden's logic or his reasoning, if he were president in 2008 or maybe 2012 or 2016, maybe we'd be seeing this then. We don't know what uh, in Afghanistan would look like or the U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan would look like if President Biden were not the President Biden now, but before. We do know that he is on record for at least a decade of saying he was against this. We should note that President Biden, before he was president, was also vice president. Mm -hmm. He was senator and the chairman of the, uh, of the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, for many, many years, he was part and parcel of U.S. foreign policy for decades. He, of course, wasn't the, the guy at the very top uh, calling, making the ultimate decisions, but he had a lot of influence in guiding American policy. So I think that is a very important point to make that Biden just didn't just show up on the scene and, uh, mm. and say, let's get out of Afghanistan. That said, this is not his war that he began, um, but he was part of the policy making and he was part of the echo chamber that we are now learning about, about the overly optimistic intelligence reports, mm. the overly optimistic understanding of the, the capacity of the Afghan government and security forces. And it was interesting that the, the, the president was also, I mean, he was laying down these lines about what can and cannot be um, criticized. You know, for example, he was saying this was the largest airlift of people in human history. He said the Afghans themselves did not fight against the Taliban um, when, after they'd been trained. And he said the U.S. since March had warned Americans 19 times to get out of the country. And so in other words, he's saying this didn't happen overnight. We warned you. This didn't happen overnight, but it should also be noted that 
President Biden just weeks ago in a press conference said, there's no way this will end chaotically. The Taliban will no way be able to take over the country this quickly. He also is on record for saying all of those things. <laughs> this has not happened overnight. This has been 20 years of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan. Many of the things we're hearing from Joe Biden tonight in 2021 are issues are were matters of debate were things being asked back in 2001 and in 2005 and in 2010 what exactly is the united states doing there what exactly is its mission let's remember joe biden was saying no more nation building but the argument to nation building was that only by building this country into a democracy can you prevent terrorism right there was a lot of double speak there that people were hearing for for years enos the president also mentioned China and Russia, saying that they would love to see the U.S. continue its presence to stay bogged down in Afghanistan. Um, what does this mean geopolitically? Are we looking at um, the emergence of a new foreign policy doctrine for the United States? Well, it sounds like it, but uh, we shall see how this works out. And as uh, William just pointed out, you know, uh, Biden is also changing uh, kind of uh, the doctrine. Oh, doctrines is maybe too big of a word, but the takes uh, he makes, um, uh, because you could also argue the other way around. I mean, what would it mean if uh, China really, really gets involved with the Taliban government in Afghanistan and maybe being supported uh, by uh, Russia? Will this be really better for the United States? So this is a big question. This speech for me was really most and mainly defending his decision and uh, reaching out and trying to convince uh, those who criticized him by not taking enough care, uh, not taking enough action to get all Americans out. And as William also and you, Brent, uh, yourself just pointed out, he said a couple of times that the Americans in Afghanistan were warned enough and that obviously that's what he says, many uh, of the didn't want to leave it that 90% of all American passport holders uh, who wanted to leave the country are out of Afghanistan by now. So this was most and mainly really defending his decision and uh, campaigning already for the midterms because I'm sure that Afghanistan will be playing a big role uh, next year in November uh, at the midterms elections. That's, that's a very good point to make. Our bureau chief in Washington, Enos Pohl, and here at the big table with me. William Bluecroft, to both of you, thank you. Well, when the sun came up over Afghanistan today, the Taliban declared victory and told the world that they are once again in control of the country. The calendar may read 2021, but there were flashes of Afghanistan in 2001, pre-9-11-2001. There's no doubt who's in control here. Taliban fighters parade their win on the tarmac of Kabul's international airport. Some even taking selfies from the cockpit of an abandoned aircraft. Thank God. First of all, I would like to say that Afghanistan is finally in every sense, free and independent. And our forces are controlling the military and civilian parts of the airport. Normal activity of the airport will be started very soon. Close by military aircraft, some apparently disabled in the rush by American troops to get out of Afghanistan as fast as possible. Just hours earlier, the commander of the 82nd Airborne Division became the last U.S. service member to leave. That prompted celebratory gunfire at the airport to mark the ending of this bitter 20-year war. Thank God that we took our country's independence. All Muslims, all Mujahideen and all Afghanistan people are happy and share the happiness with us. Taliban soldiers may be enjoying their victory, but the chaos of the last desperate days here is left, plain for all to see. Long queues continue to build up outside Kabul's banks, and there isn't a woman in sight. The Taliban is expected to form a government within the next few days. A chastened international community says it's hopeful it won't be as extreme as feared. But on the ground, it's clear who 
holds the power. Well, journalist France Marty joins me now from Kabul. We've been talking to you, France, throughout these past few weeks. You woke up today in Kabul. This is the first day without a U.S. presence in two decades. What's, what's it been like? I mean, first, people probably woke up in the middle of the night when all around the city Taliban opened celebratory gunfire, including with heavy machine guns. Um, when they woke up again in the morning, uh, most uh, just continued life as usual. When I was in the morning in the city center, shops were open, people were on the street, maybe fewer than usual. Um, but one wouldn't have noticed that uh, something historic has happened the night before. Uh, it seemed all quiet and rather normal. Um, the people I talked to, uh, they were not in a jubilant um, mood. Uh, they were rather worried. Uh, some asked me how they might be able to leave. Uh, and I had to tell them that there's not much of a reasonable way at the moment. Others uh, were worried because they said their business uh, is not running. Uh, customers uh, are not even half as many as before, no matter uh, what stores we're talking about. Um, so most were, were worried uh, what the future brings mm. and, and not celebrating victory. There have been celebrations, um, but these seemed at least to some extent staged by the Taliban. And, and what about being a journalist? in this, this, this new or this old new Afghanistan now. Um, it, it comes with risks with the Taliban being in control. I mean, are you worried about I mean, your safety moving forward? I mean, do you feel that the situation has changed for you as a reporter? I'm not worried that much. Um, the situation has certainly changed, but it's not black and white. I mean, some things have become easier, some things uh, have uh, become difficult, or rather will become more difficult. So far, the Taliban, not only regarding journalists in general, so far the Taliban haven't really announced new rules uh, or new laws. So they have taken over, they have overthrown the old order, but they haven't replaced it yet with a new one. Um, and at the moment, they kind of uh, let everything continue, daily life and so on, as it used to be before. Mm -hmm. um, this this uh, is, um, of course, will change because the Taliban have made clear that they want to change the system of the state and the laws. But how, how radical that will be, uh, that's only uh, the future can show. And, and you know, the, the Kabul airport front has been at the center of this story now for the past two weeks. And the Taliban today were announcing victory there on the tarmac. But do they have the, the, the know-how to actually operate an airport? Do they know what it's like to um, operate in police airspace over the city? Taliban, the Taliban themselves, arguably not. But um, they try to, to get people to do that, not only for the airport. I mean, they're calling on government employees uh, in all parts to like return to work exactly because they don't have the, the expertise for, for like many things. Regarding the airport, uh, there are credible reports that they are in contact with Qatar and Turkey uh, who will in or will most likely in some form like um, help the Taliban to, to get the airport running again. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, in the interest of everyone. The international community also wants a running airport for uh, diplomatic and humanitarian engagements. The Taliban wants it uh, to be connected to the outside world and for prestige reasons. So uh, it is most likely that they will get like external uh, support to uh, get the airport up and running again. All right, journalist Franz Marty joining us tonight from Kabul in a country for the first time in 20 years that has no U.S. military presence. Franz, thank you. Yeah, tonight, it is clear who holds the power in Afghanistan, but my next guest says two things were never clear, the goal and the strategy of the U.S.-led war in Afghanistan. He is the author of Un-American, A Soldier's Reckoning of Our Longest War. And he joins me tonight. I'd like to welcome Eric Edstrom to the day. Mr. Edstrom, it's good to have you on the 
So you graduated from West Point in 2007. You were deployed to Afghanistan where you were an infantry platoon leader. How does it make you feel when you see the Taliban celebrating victory in Kabul? It's a frustrating experience. I think that it was in some ways uh, almost preordained. Uh, the U.S. military occupation in Afghanistan has been struggling for years. I did not see a alternative uh, going forward. I sort of saw a either reduction to warlordism or that there would be a stalemate between Afghan forces and the Taliban or a complete rout of the government forces by the Taliban. What I did not expect was that it would uh, happen so swiftly as it had. Well, you sound like what we've, we've been hearing from the White House, um, the Pentagon and the State Department in the last two weeks. The, the U.S. president just today told Americans that there was no clean and easy end to this war. Do you agree with that? I, you'd have to take it all the way back to the beginning uh, to ask why we occupied this country for 20 years. There were easier ways to end the war, but those probably would have taken place in the years of 2001 or 2002. Uh, what could have been done after September 11th is to seek out the adherents that were responsible or presumed responsible for the attacks and capture them and bring them to uh, International Criminal Court, for instance. But we did not do that, and rather it was a full regime change over the course of two decades that did not work particularly well. Uh, so there were options. However, uh, as it closed out and as we approached uh, the end of this failed war, this negative sum war, there were options to have a cleaner and slightly easier exit, in my opinion. For starters, we could have done better capacity planning by asking exactly how many evacuees needed to be removed safely from the country and where those evacuees were located. Up to a couple of months ago, we had presence with regional airports uh, and bases throughout the country where we could have matched supply and demand of those evacuees and got them safely out of the country without a single choke point where they could basically uh, sort of surround us, use suicide bombers as was seen in this past week, and we could have expedited that um, withdrawal and left yeah. the country faster and gotten all of our evacuees out as opposed to today where we still have hundreds of thousands of Afghan allies who have been left behind, including my very own interpreter who served with me a decade ago. But, but you, you know, you, you are speaking, of course, with, with the, the, the luxury of hindsight. Um, that's what we all have right now, looking back. What would you have advised Joe Biden to do on the day that he took power back in January as U.S. president, what would you have told him to do concerning Afghanistan? Well, I wouldn't say entirely hindsight because when I deployed to Afghanistan in 2009 and 2010 for a year in, in Kandahar province, I knew that the war then uh, was not going to be winnable. Uh, it's very difficult to think that with a coalition of the most powerful military uh, units on earth with trillions of dollars of spending, how is it possible then that we couldn't route a few thousand ragtag Taliban fighters? You have to make the assumption that we're doing it on behalf of the Afghan people. You would think it would be very easy to get rid of them with all of this military might, yeah. power, money, and time. But we did not. And the reason behind that is because we are not working on behalf of the Afghan people, and that is why there has been continued resistance for years. Well, let me, now, with respect to if, Pre if, President if Biden... If I could just, let me just ask you one thing here. You know, you were on the ground in, in Afghanistan and you say you saw the situation and, and I'm sure you, communi you, you communicated what you saw to your superiors. Do you think that it went up the chain? Because there seems to have been, when you hear from leaders, past leaders, especially at the Pentagon, um, there, there seems to be this disconnect of what the boots on the ground saw and what they saw at the Pentagon and the White House. Well, I, I don't know if that's entirely true, because the Afghanistan papers revealed, for instance, I think that came out a year and a half ago, thereabouts by the Washington Post, that people knew, senior national security advisors, senior generals, everyone is on the same page that no progress is being made, 
you didn't have to ask the uh, the staff sergeant on the ground or the first lieutenant like myself who's leading an infantry platoon to find out that what we were doing is futile. Uh, to give you a bit of context, some of the missions that we would do would be to patrol the road so that we could receive uh, basically resupply so that we could continue uh, securing the road. And in this process, we would repeatedly get blown up by Taliban IEDs and by uh, rebuilding the road, the contractors would pay money in terms of tribute back to the Taliban, who then would use that money to buy more bombs. Mm -hmm. And so this recursive loop would continue year after year. Yeah, that is that is a, a fascinating point. And I think one probably that, that has not been reported thoroughly. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, the U.S. president said tonight that the fight against terrorism no longer requires boots on the ground. Over the horizon, counterterrorism is the future, he said. Uh, do you agree? I mean, I would be very cautious about any use of, of counterterrorism uh, tactics. I mean, it has not worked well. And I think that all of this needs to be couched in a larger discussion about what is the best return on our investment as an American taxpayer. Why are we spending trillions of dollars on Taliban whack-a-mole? Who knows, future you know, drone strikes on ISIS when we should be spending it in other ways with far higher return on investment, such as mitigating climate change. That would be a far better use of funding. And I uh, hope that President Biden goes down that path. All right, Eric Edstrom joining me tonight, the author of Un-American, A Soldier's Reckoning of Our Longest War. Your insights are valuable, Mr. Edstrom. We appreciate you sharing them with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And the conversation continues tonight. I am joined now by Professor Amalindu Mizra from Lancaster University in England. He's an expert in peace studies and Islamic Politics. Professor, it's good to have you on the program. You know, we, we just heard there a fairly damning appraisal of the 20-year-long the mission by the U.S. and its allies in Afghanistan. Do you share this, um, this opinion that um, the mission had neither a goal nor a, a strategy? Well, there is an attempt to see everything in black and white terms. I would say that there are shades of gray when it comes to the 20-year investment that the West made in Afghanistan. Now, I would like to pick up three separate areas where we can say that uh, something positive has happened. Number one, the number of strikes that uh, the Taliban could have had, had they been in power, was drastically reduced. So the conflict was contained to Afghanistan. We tend to forget that. Mm -hmm. Should there have been no external intervention, we don't know how many 9-11s would have happened afterwards. That's number one. Number two, there was a drastic reduction in terms of uh, poppy and heroin and opium coming to Central Asia, then to Europe during that particular period. And the credit must go to the British who were in charge of undermining that. That's number two. Number three, we are talking about making a complete transformation of the society. We are talking about almost 60 percent of Afghan uh, people at the moment who are below the age of 20 or thereabouts. And they have been brought up in this freedom this liberal atmosphere and so on and so forth. When you talk about girls, education and et cetera, et cetera, we tend to forget that this has all been achieved because of this 20 year presence. So I wouldn't say that everything was bad. Yes, things are going to look different with hindsight as you have already put it. But I would say that we have managed to achieve something. Of course, hmm. the price that we paid for it cannot be sort of mitigated trillions of dollars, 2,500 uh, lives lost from the American side, close to 500 from the British side, Jeez. hundreds from the German side, and so on and so forth. Professor, you, you say that a, an entire generation has grown up um, with, with these freedoms and with the presence of Western values in Afghanistan. But um, if you consider that, then how do you explain the fact that the Taliban was able to move in so quickly and that these... Um, the, the soldiers that were, had been trained by the U.S. And, and NATO allies, these soldiers were not willing um, to fight to um, protect these freedoms that they'd enjoyed for 20 years. Well, Afghan is a very clever person. They easily change sides. They know which side of the bread is buttered, as we put it in English. Mm -hmm. So many of the Afghan soldiers were former Taliban fighters. So they had changed when the Western powers came in. So their core 
allegiance was always there towards Taliban. So when the Taliban came in, came back to power, they realized that it's time when we change our sides. So the same thing happened in the 19, so late early 2000s when there was decommissioning, arms decommissioning taking place. People were giving the arms and then were buying it in another tent. So that is a kind of peculiar Afghan story. So if you want to find out as to why we did not manage to transform the society altogether, as the previous speaker had said, uh, they didn't want any kind of foreign intervention to begin with. So their yeah. loyalty was with their own indigenous people. And that yes. is where we lost. Yeah, that's a very good point. And we will see if if that remains moving forward in the mindset of the people. Professor Amarlindu Misra from Lancaster University in England. Professor, we appreciate your, your time and your insights tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, Germany's Foreign Minister Heiko Maas is winding up four days of talks with countries around Afghanistan, likely to be able to help with ongoing evacuations. Last stop on his tour is Qatar, where Mr. Maas held a joint press conference today with his Qatari counterpart, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdulrahman Al Thani. Now, Qatar has served as a transit point for many of the evacuees. The Gulf Arab state has close ties to the West but also to the Taliban. The German foreign minister talked about the Taliban's promise to keep the airport in Kabul open and to allow Afghans who want to, to leave the country. As far as air travel is concerned, Qatar plays a particularly important role for departures, but also for deliveries of aid. For the people of Afghanistan, it will be crucial whether the airport in Kabul can continue to operate, and here too you will play a leading role. Well, DW's Rebecca Ritters joins me now from Doha in Qatar tonight. It's good to see you, Rebecca. Qatar is important for two Big reasons at the moment. I want to start first with the Afghan refugees. Qatar has been the first stop for almost half of the refugees airlifted out of the country. What happens when those planes land that are full of people? That's right, Brett. Some 40,000 uh, evacuees have been transiting through here. Uh, uh, that's nearly 50% of all the people that were uh, taken out of Afghanistan. Uh, so it's quite uh, quite a lot. When they arrive, it uh, depends who's looking after them. If the Qataris are looking after them, they go to some very quite comfortable uh, dwellings, actually uh, dwellings that are prepared for the 2022 World Cup. Uh, and they live there in their family units and are provided for. Then there's uh, another bunch that were evacuated by the U.S. And they're at the Al Udaid Air Base, the U.S. side of that Air base and they're there in uh, more military-style accommodations. Now they're also being they're being processed here. Uh, their documents are being prepared for their final destinations, uh, and of course all the corona testing that goes along with uh, the coronavirus, obviously making things much more difficult for the evacuation. So most of the re refugees, the evacuees, will be just transiting through here and then going on to their final destinations. Yeah, and the country though, it's not only a transit country for Afghan refugees, right? I mean, some will stay. Or will they not? It's, there are a number that are expected to stay. Now, I have been asking the Qatari government. That number is not final. Uh, I do know about a group of young robotic students that they are going to be, um, they've been given visas to stay here to continue their education. So some people will definitely stay uh, in Doha, in, Kota, in Qatar, but, uh, but not a great number of them, I'm led to believe. Now, Doha, where you are, ha has also been hosting, along with New York City, talks concerning the future of Afghanistan. Who is talking to whom here? Well, Qatar have long played an important role in, uh, you know, hosting uh, the Taliban, if you will. They, they, since 2013, they invited the Taliban to open up their headquarters here. Uh, so they've been here conducting, operating as a sort of a neutral ground, if you will. The, the Taliban feel that Qatar is a neutral. It's like a Switzerland to them. They feel kind of secure here to then negotiate with the West. Peace talks have been ongoing here, not just between the West, but also for intra-Afghan talks. They've been ongoing. A peace deal was signed here earlier this year. Obviously, that is now a defunct deal. Uh, but they have played a very important role. Uh, and here, from here, the, the US uh, 
other countries, their allies, Germany, have been able to hold talks with the Taliban. So they do play a very important role, not just with the evacuation, mm -hmm. although obviously with the evacuation they have even ramped up that role and they're playing an even bigger role, a bigger role than many expected, in fact. I got about a minute left, Rebecca. I want to ask you, have you, what have you been hearing from people there about the significance of this day, August 31st? Uh, well, it obviously is a significant date. I, I think uh, there's different opinions. Some people saying it, it was a good move to come out earlier for the security uh, of the U.S. Uh, and allied soldiers, uh, the uh, and the of course uh, Afghans there, evacuees, everyone trying to get out. That the security situation was becoming so dire that the 31st was a really important date. There are other people saying that that was far too soon. Um, but obviously, that you know, pre U.S. President Joe Biden had made that date and he was determined to stick to it uh, and pull out before the 11th of September deadline. He made that August 31st deadline and that's, uh, he, he was very determined to stick to that. Uh, so that's just the way that it is. And, and people here, I mean, you know, the date, whether it was this week or next week, I think, you know, is not that significant to people here on the ground. All right, TW's Rebecca Ritters in Doha tonight. Rebecca, thank you.